It's funny, when I first heard this topic of reimagining the future of the internet surveillance and privacy, things that came to mind were like enemy of the state and minority report, you know, this kind of pop culture notion of the ways in which kind of big brother or somebody is always watching. And so I'd like to, during this conversation, to really dig a bit deeper when we consider uh, where we are right now with the state of technology, what the internet is doing, and how uh, these particular ideas of surveillance and privacy, what that interplay is like. I am uh, humbled to be up here with people who are far more intelligent than I am. Um, and so I, I will not bore you with too many of my thoughts, but really keep the conversation on these guys. But I, I'm joined by Barton Gelman, uh, who's a journalist and blogger based at the Century Foundation in New York, who covered the Snowden Papers extensively for the Washington Post. He's also the author of the best-selling Angler, the Cheney Vice Presidency. We have Madeline Ashby, who is so cute and adorable and so fun and smart and wonderful. I am a new fan because I was blog stalking you the other day mm -hmm. um, in preparation for this. <laughs> and so I'm so, um, you're just fun. You make me smile. But Madeline is a science fiction writer and strategic foresight consultant. She's the author of VN and ID, both part of her Machine Dynasty series, and the author of By the Time We Get to Arizona, story in uh, hieroglyphs, stories and visions for a better future and Kevin Bankston, uh, who is the policy director of the Open Technology Institute with New America Foundation. And he was previously senior counsel at, and the director of the Free Expression Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Sorry, I don't have crushes on you, Barton, <laughs> like I have on Madeline. I'm going to work for it. I'm going to make you work for it. So I, I mean, I want to step back first and kind of just have you each say a bit about the landscape we're in currently. You know, there's reality and then there's the science fiction side of things, but would love to hear each of your takes, and I'll start with you, Bart. Um, where are we now, the state of the internet surveillance and privacy? What, what, what's the picture looking like? Well, what, what interests me most in my reporting uh, on, on most subjects, and certainly on technology and privacy and surveillance, is the question of power. We all understand that information is power, uh, and so you have an intersection of secrecy uh, on the part of, the, of these large, powerful entities that are gathering data about us, uh, and sort of more and more new levels of uh, sort of extreme, spooky kinds of penetration into our personal lives. Uh, as has been said several times today, they, they, they know us in some ways better than we know ourselves. Uh, and so we're inside this one-way mirror. Uh, and uh, I'm also interested in looking for uh, some inspiration from science fiction and from, from imaginative writers about what could be the forces that would tend to uh, empower individuals against large uh, sort of central entities, uh, rich companies and governments uh, in order to defend themselves. And the issue with technology is whether it's really working for you uh, uh, or whether it's working for someone else. So the point of my question earlier about privacy implications of, uh, of technology is fundamentally, uh, you know, we, we, we look at these uh, smartphones, for example, as if they're some kind of uh, supercharged version of uh, Joan on Mad Men, just sort of, you know, has the answer to everything, ultra competent, tells you what you need to know just when you need to know it, and that would be fantastic if she was working for you. Uh, 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 but she's not. I mean, you get some side benefits of it, some amazing things that I wouldn't really like to live without, uh, but she's ultimately working for somebody else. She's following you around and writing down what you do and sending it back home, except in real time. Uh, and so I'm interested in, in what would limit uh, powerful people or uh, what would limit societies from taking the incentives of the powerful um, all the way to their, uh, to their culminating point. So uh, as, a, as a parallel here uh, for a science fiction loving audience, uh, decades ago, Larry Niven imagined a world just at the very beginning of organ transplants uh, in which uh, the technology would get so good that you could uh, extend your life you know, hundreds of years, potentially, uh, with a constant supply of fresh organs. And of course, there's going to be a societal shortage of those, and so uh, someone gets the bright idea of, uh, of uh, taking uh, <coughs> executed prisoners and just 
disassembling them into the organ bank, and there's still a shortage. And so the logical culmination is that everything becomes a capital offense. Uh, and I'm not even sure he saw that as dystopia. <laughs> I mean, if you read the Gil the Arm series. But uh, we didn't go there. We haven't gone there. And so what is, it that, what is it that stops a society from going that far? And I'm, inter I'm interested in, in inspiration on that, uh, um, both technically and also in terms of communal values. Madeline, as you answer that, I want you to also pick up on this another, uh, this other theme, which is, you know, we, we live in this self-select, uh, we self-select ourselves into this kind of selfie culture, mm -hmm. right? You know, and Bart talks about, yeah, well, who's, who's Siri or whoever, who, who's working, how's that all working together? So talk a bit as well about how our behavior in terms of how we self-select into this culture, how that impacts the picture. Well, everyone is under the delusion that they're special. And, uh, and you think that the things that you post to Facebook are unique because they have your name over them and that avatar that you chose from that vacation that you took that is the same vacation that millions of other people took. Um, and, and stuff. So there's this idea that if I just edit it together in the right way, if I just edit and curate and craft and manufacture this narrative about myself that it'll be somehow different, I will somehow be different from, from everyone else. And in fact, to the eyes, in the eyes of surveillance, in, in, in the large red hell eye that is operated by, by governments and corporations across the world, you're not. You are ones and zeros and, and, and data that comes in about sales and likes and preferences and times that you were at certain places and things that you checked into. And all of that is just sort of stuff that you leave behind you, like pixie dust, that, that they use to fly into new profit margins. The, the, you know, that's sort of the, the, the other grand illusion of this system is that you, know, you, you think that you are crafting a certain amount of information that you're sharing and that you're doing it strategically in order to create a personal brand, which is what we teach kids to do now, is create a personal brand, because they're not going to work in the same fields. Uh, they're not going to have the same job for 30 years anymore. They're going to move jobs every like four years, if they're lucky. Um, in the meantime, they have to have one constant, and it'll be their brand. Um, the, so there's this idea that if, if we just create this thing and we maintain it and, and, and keep it going, then you know, that, then they'll only know that. If I perform my identity well enough, then they'll only, you know, then that's the thing that'll, that will be enduring. No, no, no one on the other side of the camera cares. If they care, you know, the, they care if you've committed a crime or they suspect you of having committed a crime or they, or, or they want to find a reason for you of, to have committed a crime or a reason to, have, to suspect you of having committed a crime or a reason to, to profile you. That's what they care about. Um, and so I think that there's this, there's this tension between opt-in culture and, and, and selfie culture and the, the needs and the desire of, of, a, of, of a system that essentially trawls for data in the way that we trawl for fish. And they look the same, right? That, you know, we trawl for fish in order to get salmon. What we pick up is like 10% salmon and 90% <laughs> small fish and fry and, and what are called in the industry garbage fish. And um, it's called in the NSA industry incidental collection. Yeah, it's called <laughs> incidental collection um, and, and stuff. And, and, in, and in the process of incidental collection, all of those pictures that you took for your boyfriend are in there. <laughs> I would not at all be surprised if, if we later found out that these were where leaks of like Jennifer Lawrence's photos came from. Um, um, so the... Uh, so in in all of that is your is your life, and I think like the the over the question that we're going to find, you know, ourselves answering or other people answering for us over time is how do we sift, uh, you know, how are algorithms going to sift the the gold from the silt as time moves as time moves on? Because we are only creating more inputs. The more wearables you put on your body, the more data you are generating, the more. The, the more facts there are for them to sift through to, to find out more things about you. And that creates a huge amount of sort of data to be sifted. And people won't be looking at that like algorithms will. And they'll determine, like, it'll, 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 uh, it'll be decided by, by things that are not, that are hopefully not um, ruled by the same biases as people are. That's actually, it's probably a better solution that way. So, so Kev Kevin, what, 
where's the good news? <laughs> right? where, 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 where's we'll the get to that. Side of this? But I'm not a good news kind of guy. <laughs> Actually, I, I want to take it back to uh, Neil's introductory comments and the themes of the book and the event. This idea of hieroglyphs. We're talking about these positive hieroglyphs in science fiction that have inspired us to do big things, whether it's Heinlein's rockets or, or uh, Asimov's robots or Gibson's cyberspace or whatever. Um, but, you know, I'm one of those fans of dystopia that Neil was talking about earlier. I believe in the power also of the negative hieroglyph. I believe in the power of the cautionary tale that tells us what we need to avoid. And I think the single most powerful science fiction work we've had at a policy level mm -hmm. easily is 1984 because it has given this hieroglyph, this touch point, uh, this code for saying what we're worried about when we're worried about state surveillance in a way that everyone immediately understands. Um, and I want to see more of that. So like, I, I, I fully support this idea of a second volume that's all really scary <laughs> stuff. Um, and so, but I want to talk about, we can talk about today's surveillance in contrast in comparison with 1984. I think, so I think um, you know, I, I think in some ways, uh, Orwell got some things really wrong. Like, for example, in 1984, the idea of state surveillance power involved you knowing that you were surveilled. Big Brother is watching. He is either watching or he has the power to watch. That is what's going to control you and chill you. Um, that is the case, I think, with the internet in China or Iran, for example. That's not the case here. Here, the surveillance is subtle. Here, the surveillance is unknown, sometimes lied about, sometimes hidden. Um, and so one of the things he got right was the idea of newspeak to the extent that we have an intelligence apparatus that has kept it a secret from us that we are all being swept up in their, you know, uh, in their tuna net. Um, and, uh, uh, and now when they're, they're, they're challenged on it, they say things like, well, sure, we're, like, we're collecting it all, but we're not collecting it all because it really only counts if we look at it. And, and that's the kind of um, evasion and the kind of like, don't worry, we're not actually surveilling you that I think, that I think uh, Orwell didn't really anticipate. Um, but one other thing he did anticipate, which Ryan, Ryan alluded to earlier, and which um, I and uh, uh, our friend and colleague Ashkan Soltani, who also works with Barton on a lot of his NSA reporting, have talked about in a paper, is the rapidly falling cost of surveillance. The fact that with changes in technology, the capacity to not target someone for surveillance, but go ahead and surveil everybody and pick your targets afterward um, has become the rule, not the exception. We have moved from retail to wholesale surveillance, and it is the dropping cost of technology that has allowed that. Um, and so I'll get to a positive vision and a positive hieroglyph <laughs> at some point, and it'll involve how do we raise the costs of that surveillance. But I'm going to save that. Well, I mean, but what's interesting about it, right, because on one hand, on a very commercial level, we talk about all the magic that new technologies bring, right? We're all hyper-connected. I cannot leave the house without three devices. Part of it is fueled by the fact that I have a very cute one-year-old who I have to stay in contact, con you know, constant contact with. But you know, that, that still being the case, I think about what you're saying now about all of the ways in which we self-select, right? And all the information we willingly put out there. So even if the costs of surveillance are high, or you know, it's, so what? If we're putting everything out on Facebook, on Twitter, we're using all the wearable devices, I, what's that balancing point? I, 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 I'd actually like to address that uh, because uh, I, I profoundly disagree with, uh, uh, with some of the statements about this uh, idea of our, the voluntariness of our self-disclosure um, that was uh, mooted on a previous panel. Uh, that, that is rooted uh, in a fundamental misunderstanding about the way the data economy works. Uh, a, it's not true that young people aren't interested in their privacy. Uh, they, their norms about how, what they talk about and how they talk among themselves are different than ours may have been, but, they, but it's a relational uh, decision. Uh, they care very much about not having their parents find out stuff, and so they talk in code to each other with song lyrics uh, and, and, uh, and in symbolic postings uh, that they understand. They hope their teachers and principals don't. Uh, they make efforts, but uh, incompetent efforts, uh, to control the privacy settings uh, because those, the privacy settings are designed to fail. Uh, they, and 
I don't know what the percentage is. It's possible that no one does. But some very large majority of what Facebook knows about me, for example, is not that anything that I voluntarily disclosed. If you look at their terms of service and privacy policy, they talk about what they gather uh, about you. And they say, we gather certain kinds of information from your devices. Well, that's not very helpful. Uh, and uh, it turns out that if you're logged into Facebook and then you're browsing somewhere else, they can see that you went to the you know, WebMD and looked up syphilis. Uh, and uh, they know my cell phone number, even though I've never told it to them, because uh, lots of my friends, most of them not even realizing what they're doing, uh, click OK to the, do you want to upload your whole address book to us? Uh, <coughs> so now they probably have 75 copies of my cell phone number, which I would not voluntarily have given to them. Uh, and so. And, and they, they work very hard, as does the US government and other governments and other companies, to conceal from us uh, how transparent we've become. Uh, they work hard, I mean, to, to, the, to the point of, uh, of, uh, of, of lawsuits, of obscuring technology, of, of outright refusal to uh, give truthful answers. Uh, and so to me, because I'm in the nonfiction side of this, in the, uh, of the information business, what I value is transparency. I think one, the more you know, and I think the Snowden disclosures have showed this, the more you know, uh, the more you have the ability to decide for yourself uh, where you want to draw the line. So the, the, the piece that, uh, that Kevin and uh, Ashkan wrote about the diminishing cost of surveillance raised the question, is, is the traditional expense of following someone around, which requires three teams of four people around the clock uh, to do properly, is that a bug or a feature? Uh, it, 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 and, and what they raise very interestingly is, is the idea that you don't actually want a perfectly in efficient uh, law enforcement or national security state, because you give up way too much if you go there. Yeah, I'd also like to echo the point that, that there's this idea floating around that kids are not concerned with privacy. And, and, if, that, and if that were true, girls who were cyberbullied wouldn't commit suicide. They care. Um, they, they, it's important to them. It's just not, it, that people think it's not important to them because they talk about sex. And that was somehow, that used to somehow be verboten. Um, the, so I think that there's, one, I think we need to let go of that delusion. And further, I think that Western culture has habituated us to the idea of there being constant surveillance anyway. It is the, it is the foremost tenet of most religions <laughs> that someone is always watching you, <laughs> sees everything that you do. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. <laughs> he knows if you've been bad or good. So you be good, for goodness sake. So I think that you know we've we've grown up with this idea that there's always this thing. I, I always feel like somebody's watching me, <laughs> um, and so I think that it's inevitable that we would, having sustained this long cultural expectation of observation, we have made it real, <laughs> and and increasingly we're building up and building up and building up to get to this point of of creating multiple personas that are watching us all the time. We have not one God that watches us, but several. It's like a pantheon of, of things that are constantly observing us. And, and somehow we're okay with it. And I can only look at the legacy, sort of the legacy code within our culture that makes that possible. Um, further, we've, we use like the data that we sort of willingly let out there, aside from the stuff that Facebook is culling from you, every day that you have, that you have no, no idea about. We use all of that information that we, that we share about ourselves and uh, that others share with us to be incredibly judgmental <laughs> and, and, to, and to do terrible things to each other and to share terrible secrets and to create drama <laughs> and, and so on. So I think that there's, there is a, we have always as a species have a fascination with observing what's Interesting to me is that we don't really have a critical language aside, like aside from journalism and aside from just getting the facts. Now that we have more of the facts, thanks to people like you, um, we we now I think need to develop a critical language for for sort of theorizing surveillance in general. What's weird is how how uh, how those f how looking at surveillance and looking at sort of film theory fall together. Right? They're all about the power of the gaze. And we've actually been talking about that for a very, very long time. We just didn't know that we were talking about what was being done to us 
rather than what Alfred Hitchcock was doing to Tippi Hedren. <laughs> so can I just key off one thing you said, and I, I don't want to take your, your time, but uh, you, you mentioned sex, right? and, and from the evidence of your stories, oh, yeah. that's, uh, <laughs> that's, a, uh, that, that's something you think uh, about, a about a lot. <laughs> and, uh, and what's fascinating to me is, I mean, this is supposed to be the optimistic volume, right? This is supposed to be the inspirational one. And, uh, and, and the two stories that I've come across so far that, that have the most to do with surveillance. Uh, the, the, the tiny little note of optimism in each one comes from some sort of, you know, very exceptional and personalized human uh, interaction. And so uh, basically all of the counter surveillance uh, in your story to caricature just a little bit happens below the waist, right? Yes, so it's, yes. it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it, it's, it's almost like a, a manual for the next surveillance despot uh, to invent uh, the, uh, you know, better toilet monitoring technology, uh, shower cams, and not to leave the desert uncovered because you think someone's having outdoor sex or you're gonna miss something important. Uh, but so that, that, that uh, the idea that ingenious, exceptional individuals, uh, by taking advantage of the, furry, the, 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 the the prudery of the nanny state, can find some little enclave of privacy, uh, Gosh, I hope I hope I hope well, we come up with a better and answer. Actually, than and that, actually, right? that's and actually that's not true. That's a that's sort of a that's that's actually kind of more hopeful on my part because um, I think it was in Marin County uh, a couple of years ago. Um, students had been given iPads or laptops or something like that for you know it was Marin. Of course, they got laptops. The um, and and for school that was they were issued these devices. Um, those were loaded with spyware that could turn on at any time to see if kids were actually on task. Um, and kids were watched over the cameras. So the operators of this software started turning them on at night while kids were getting dressed, while teenage girls were getting dressed. So, and that didn't stop them. At the only reason that it came up, it, that, that we learned this is because a principal at one of the schools saw someone eating those hot tamale candies and assumed that they were like second all or something like that. Or, or pills, and said, oh, that kid's doing drugs. That kid's doing dope. Bring him in. And it's like, his parents then asked, well, wait, how, how did you know? Why, why would that occur to you? Show us, show us the evidence. And that was the evidence. And it blew open wide this, I, this realization that all of the things that you can be issued, even to minors, even <laughs> can, can be used for, for whatever, whatever purposes. Uh, the, the individuals behind them might, well, might want to use them for. <laughs> spinning off of below the waist, nudie pictures, and the unwanted gaze. Yeah. You know, we have this event that just happened that in many ways I think is gonna prove as important, well not as important as the Snowden revelations, but like this huge, and we shouldn't call it leak, this huge no, yeah. theft and publication of all these celebrities' nude photos yeah. um, is a really good example of how they, and we, and the people who bring these yeah. microphones and cameras into our lives, and in fact use them to mediate our sex lives. Right. We are trusting these things to be private. It's not that we're giving away our privacy. In many instances, we are believing these things to be private, and then they end up not being private. Um, and that's a problem, um, but one that there are potential solutions for. I mean, I think in many ways we do need to focus, and this is sort of the positive hieroglyph for me, uh, is on securing the internet and our devices as a means of protecting privacy, uh, not just as a means of being worried about the Chinese or the Russians or uh, whatever, but also just in terms of protecting our personal privacy against any attacker, whether it's people on 4chan who want nudie pictures or uh, you know economic espionage. And this isn't actually fantasy or science fiction. Um, the Snowden revelations have actually begun prompting, I think, a seismic shift in the security of the internet. You are seeing the major corporate actors begin to spend resources on encrypting more of everything, encrypting the traffic between us and their websites, between their mail servers and their data links. We're seeing Apple and Google uh, give us default encryption, finally, um, on our portable devices um, to match the security we've long had available on our laptops. Um, this is my positive hieroglyph for the yeah. privacy debate, is the the fully encrypted internet. And, and uh, we're now seeing in response to the Apple and Google story, there's finally government pushback on that. And I think we're gonna have to have a debate 
that we really already had in the 90s when the intelligence community and law enforcement wanted back doors into crypto systems then. And they wanted basically a system where everyone would hand over their keys and those would be trust, kept with a trusted third party and then the government could good, come get those keys with a warrant. Um, and the conclusion after many years of fighting over this was that actually no, if we want a secure information economy that has to rely on secure information devices. And if we build back doors into these devices or into these networks to facilitate law enforcement or intelligence, we're actually shooting our future in the foot. Um, so. so, I mean, really quickly, you know, it's, it's <coughs> interesting because this conversation is focused a lot on kind of government surveillance, mm -hmm. you know, the, the big surveillance, but we take it to even current events, right, the flip side. So in D Washington, D.C. now, you know, cops are using these little cop yeah. cameras cop that they have to wear um, in terms of whenever they go out on the street. Or if you think about, you know, what kind of took the news by storm over the past several weeks um, out in Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Uh, Missouri, what happened with Michael Brown. And like over time, we've s seen um, several instances more recently of cases of brutality, profiling, um, popping up from a standpoint of citizen surveillance, right? So is there a role for creating a narrative around how citizens can use and better leverage technology to do some of what you're saying, change some of those power dynamics, right? Because if you are all powerful and you are the only one who has a view on what's happening, you can do what you want versus right, right, if right. there's some concern that, oh, somebody else might be watching and st citizens may get outraged. Right. How so does coming that back balance? to this question of power, information as power, the idea of a one-way mirror, uh, the government has no private right of privacy against us uh, who it's supposed to be representing. And so when you turn the camera around, so to speak, uh, that, actually, that actually tends towards uh, improving the quality of democratic accountability and decision making. Uh, and so technology can, can be part of an answer uh, offensively, if you want to put it that way, uh, monitoring our, monitor, you know, monitoring our, our you know, watching our watchers, uh, uh, just as it can defensively. But uh, I've become increasingly skeptical of the power of technology uh, to give uh, small groups or individuals uh, sufficient leverage uh, in counterforce to, uh, to large institutions. So I'm, I'm an enthusiastic user of encryption and anonymity tools uh, and have been for a while. And if I weren't, I would not have been able to talk to Ed Snowden mm -hmm. over a period of months before the first uh, disclosures came out. Uh, but it's quite clear to me now that no matter how good uh, your uh, ComSec and your OPSEC and no matter how much of this stuff you learn, and there's a big tax on your time to do that, mm -hmm. Uh, which I now find worth paying, but, uh, uh, but most people wouldn't. Uh, no matter how much of that you do, you cannot beat people who have billions of dollars in budgets or economic incentives uh, to get past you. And so they don't, you know, you say, no one can defeat my uncrackable encryption, but you know, it's sort of like uh, a story that uh, in newsrooms is called, and this is a joke, uh, too good to check. Uh, I, I haven't actually checked this, but what, what I seem to recall learning once is that uh, 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 Genghis Khan did not, uh, did not succeed in invading China by breaking down the Great Wall, obviously. Um, he bribed the guards and put up uh, ladders, and that's what in, uh, in the security business they call a side channel attack. Uh, it, you know, no matter, no matter uh, how good a wall you build here, someone's going to find a way around it. If you don't have legal or political or market or other forces that are pushing back hard. Sorry? I want to um, see Kevin because you yeah. were in the middle of a um, statement. Well, so I, I think I agree with Barton in several ways. This reminds me of a book by a science fiction author. I'm going to keep trying to bring it back to sci-fi. Uh, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> named David Brin. Uh, his book is called The Transparent Society, early 90s. And the basic thesis, which I fear may be true but still sucks, is that the technology is getting so cheap and so available that, uh, you know, and he focuses a lot on like tiny little drones that can come in your house or whatever, that trying to stop the spread of it and trying to stop spying on each other is just not going to work as a policy option. And so instead we should focus on ensuring that everyone has access to the technology so that at least we can equalize power. And so that, so it's not a situation where like the state or the corporation or the whatever has a monopoly on this ability. 
Um, and Except that, by the way, in his book, the the the, uh, the disfavored, in this case, convicts, uh, explicitly had had less privilege of having knowledge uh, than everyone else. So they all wore glasses, but uh, he couldn't see you. You could see him. Yeah, no, there's there's actually a debate going on between um, Bryn and a writer who I greatly respect and adore, Peter Watts, who, uh, Peter's a marine biologist by training and sort of is also a, con uh, is, has also had uh, a terrible, terrible experience with this country. And, and as such, um, you know, set, sort of said, you know, this, you know, this, this idea that if we just watch them back, they'll suddenly start behaving. That presumes uh, an equality of risk. It assumes that they can be shamed by our gaze in the way that we are shamed by theirs. That's not how it works. When, when a bigger animal is looking at a smaller animal, the smaller animal runs away <laughs> and, and stuff. There's, there is something to be said for things like protective coloring <laughs> and camouflage and so on, to borrow his metaphor. These are, these are his ideas and not mine. So you can look it up. It became a kind of kerfuffle. And I, yeah, I just wanted to face yeah. the thought. And also <laughs> so, say, sorry. Peter yeah. Watts is freaking awesome. You should read his stuff. Yeah. Um, but uh, when it comes to the Transparent Society, I, you know, I fault the thesis to the extent that, like, I'm never going to be able to get a spy drone into the FISA court that's authorizing all this surveillance. You know, like, the government is always going to be better at this game. We're not going to perfectly equalize it. But also, there's this aspect of it to me that, and, and I credit this thought to, to Dana Boyd, a social scientist in this area, it's very easy for an empowered white man to say, <laughs> well, hey, let's just all be transparent and eventually we'll all get over our differences and be tolerant of, of diversity. You know, it's very easy for that person to say that. It's very easy for Mark Zuckerberg to say, uh, I think it's unethical for you to have different aspects of your personality that you present in different ways. Um, I think a totally transparent society, you know, could lead, I, I mean, like, I don't know why we would assume that it would lead to a kumbaya moment rather than like people ending up in camps. <laughs> there, there's the 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 novel that swept all the awards this year within the science fiction community, and and Lecky's Ancillary Justice um, actually takes on this idea. It, it posts it in a very far future where there is a complete lack of privacy, and and there is one civilization that rules everything, and they are not very kind. They're very civilized, but they are not very kind. Um, they are not what we would call, they're humans who are inhumane. And, and so, so even at the level of like the very far future, we, we, science fiction writers are still considering this as an option. As we, we're gonna keep the conversation going, but I do wanna open up the floor to questions. Um, if there are any, we have one back here. Mm -hmm. Madeline, at the New York event, you said that uh, that the code for um, security has become surveillance, you know, in, in, or the yeah, I mean, you know, security is just code for surveillance. And in D.C., we really need actual security yeah. because they are out to get us. And <laughs> um, and in some way, and, you know, with the Secret Service scandal recently, uh, can, can you talk about that and how that it's by 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 saying you're getting security when you're actually doing surveillance, you're actually really putting everybody at risk. Yeah, because surveillance is a, um, can be a, a really passive behavior because it's watching, it's observing. Um, it, it is there in some ways so that you can either build a case or so that you will have evidence to build a case later. Right, it's so it's there when you know, the London tube is full of surveillance and it's there so that if someone bombs it, they'll know who did it. The, the, uh, and, and was done after, after 05. Um, so, there, I think that there's a difference between actively pursuing safety for other people um, and sort of passively observing. And I think that we've fallen under this delusion that if we just passively observe, if we just, if we just have all the information, if we have what is called total information awareness, then we'll be safe. If I just know more, if I just, if I just find all the things, if I just do all the research, if I just keep watching the feeds, which is in fact cargo cultism. If I just keep doing this one thing, I'll get exactly what I want. If I just perform the, the behavior that, that, uh, that has worked in the past, then it will continue working in the future because the world never changes. So I think that we have to actually start thinking about what actually makes people safe. 
The things that make people safe, the things that make neighborhoods safe, the things that, that, that make other countries like us more are things like economic security, getting kids in school, making sure that they're fed, making sure that, that people don't go bankrupt from, from financing cancer treatments. Those are like basic human needs that, that can be sort of fostered everywhere that really calm a lot of people down and make them want to behave well. <laughs> and, and that makes nations secure. That's what brings people together. Um, so that's, that's sort of what I would work on. I know we have, I saw three questions here, and we have two over there, and I think one in the back. But while we run through all of these, uh, Kevin, sure. I would like you to think about um, what is the policy fix that helps us? The policy fix. <laughs> oh, there's one. There's only one. There's only one. It has to be all-encompassing, um, all-powerful. But I want to, can you incorporate those thoughts wow. perhaps um, as part of? What well, I mean, there, there's, there's code as a fix, there's law as a fix, there's custom and, and norms as a fix. I mean, right now, we are actually in the midst of a legislative process trying to pass a bill that would restrain some of the NSA conduct that we're most worried about. Uh, it's been a tough slog, and it only addresses one sliver of what they're doing. I don't think legislation will move fast enough to address these problems. Um, then the question comes, well, what can we do technologically? As I mentioned, there are a lot of things a lot of people are doing technologically to try and to, you know, do self-help uh, against surveillance by all comers, whether it's the NSA or the Chinese or you know, your everyday hacker. Uh, hacker. Um, and, uh, but I, to sort of pivot the question and to bring up another science fiction uh, novel, uh, there's a great book called Quantum Thief by a guy named Hanu Rajanemi that posits in many ways what is a privacy utopia where we all basically have these things in our heads that negotiate agreements with everybody else and their things in their heads to agree on a level of privacy. So I can have a conversation with you and we can automatically negotiate basically a contract that you're gonna forget this part of it and I'm gonna forget this part of it or we're both gonna forget it or we're both gonna record it forever. And we can do the same thing in public space. The public space has been negotiated it's either semi-public, you know, where you know, it's viewable but it's ephemeral, or it's fully private, or it's fully public. And everyone knows and everyone has agency. The question then becomes though, what if that system gets hacked? <laughs> what if that system that you were relying on to be secure is insecure? And so when I come back to the policy response, I'm gonna come back to my positive hieroglyph, which is not only do we need laws that are going to ensure better congressional or judicial oversight of the executive branch and its surveillance and ensure that constitutional uh, you know, principles are followed, we also need laws to ensure that we can have and continue to have and build and continue to build secure technologies rather than having, say, mandated backdoors into our technologies or mandated retention of data for the use of law enforcement if they decide they ever need it or other um, you know, ma legally mandated uh, in, you know, insecurity mandates. I think, I think, and so in that way, it's a defensive action. We, we need to actually prevent that, and that's one of the key fixes. Okay, we have a question right here. Um, I was wondering if you can comment on something that seems to be happening now, and that is that we trust people less and trust machines more. So the machines are unbiased and the data they record is accurate. People are fallible and manipulative. So, I don't ask you what you've been doing. I look at the record of where you've been and what you were doing, and I will trust that before I will trust what you have to say. Um, that seems to be accelerating. That does not seem to be slowing down in any way. And I'm wondering what that means for us as people, as humans, as we become more and more connected in more and more ways. Uh, no, I, I, I think I'd rather hear what these guys are doing about that. <laughs> I'm not sure I accept the premise, but uh, I, I don't know. I, like, I, I kind of do accept the premise, but I don't see it as bad. Most of, a lot of the literature uh, from the past centuries is about how living in a small town that you can't get out of is really awful. Um, and, and that living in communities that you don't like is really awful. There are a lot of people who don't like interacting with people. Um, and, and that's fine. They're introverted or they just, or, or they know that people are judging them or, or frankly, they're marginalized people who know that they are being judged. So I think there's, there is something to be said about the objectivity of random data. What, what the, the mark against that is the lack of context. 
we talk about depersonal, the depersonalization of data, what we mean is that there's a lack of context that would make all of these behaviors make perfect sense. So that, uh, so that you know, the machine doesn't have to be like BBC Sherlock assigning all of these logic chains to, to events and then delivering some sort of diagnosis or, or prognosis or analysis of behavior. Um, you know, we understand context. We're context-seeking animals. Uh, machines are not. On the other hand, the, the, the nice thing about machines is that you actually have to program the racism in. <laughs> it doesn't just come with the model. <laughs> so we have, that was a great, um, great way to launch into what will be our lightning round. We have, I have one here in the blue shirt. And so we're going to do um, lightning round questions and responses because we want to get as many people as we can in the next five minutes. When I first started on the internet back when it still had, you know, strings and tin cans, <laughs> We were told to be pseudonymous. Yes. I set up with a pseudonym. My back door into giving up my privacy was Amazon. So I want commentary on that. The Brave New World side rather than the 1984 side. Hmm. We can make that a compound question unless someone has a burning response. I, I, think, we, I think we want to be both. I, 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 I'm a writer, I want people to read me, so I want to be myself on the net in, for some purposes, and I want to be completely anonymous for others, and I'm not going to be talking about those, except for, uh, uh, except for the part where I'm an I'm a investigative reporter and I need confidential relationships uh, to do my job. I think it's important to have both, to have the option of both, and that's why, for example, it's a good thing that now Google+, Plus, which previously pushed you to use a real name, no longer requires you to use a real name. Facebook still requires you to use a real name. Um, but then again, there are other, other networks that you can use, like Twitter, where you can be synonymous. But um, uh, I'm gonna, I was going to plug another sci-fi book, but I'm going to let it go. <laughs> okay. We have one I, right here, and then... Yeah, yeah. yeah this uh, digi digital panopticon that you're talking about was getting ready for a major upgrade with the uh, convergence of uh, mobile internet, GPS mm -hmm. technology, cheap sensors, big data analytics, and the explosion of social media. Uh, my question in terms of, of foresight, where all this technology is leading to? Uh, it is going to an internet of things that will act like your personal assistant all the time. Um, it's, going to, it's going to a life where everything around you is alive. It'll be like all the... Like, it'll be like a Disney like film. And I, I it'll would, be I like would, Snow White. And I, I would commend just uh, watching you uh, all the time. Uh, uh, Lee, <laughs> Lee, Lee Castino's uh, story of the same volume, uh, 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 Johnny Appledrone, uh, gives you pretty good in yeah. uh, interesting ideas, as does uh, Madeline's story about where it might be going. Mm -hmm. um, this is sort of in the, the positive hieroglyph idea. Um, not too long ago, I think it was the Rhizome 7-on-7 seven seven where they put technologists and artists together. One of the projects was called um, my girlfriend cares way more about my data than the NSA does. Mm. And I, mm. I just wonder, I mean, this has been, for understandable reasons, kind of a bummer. <laughs> but is there, do, do you guys see any potential really cool stuff that could be happening with the data in terms of healthcare information and, um, oh. or, or whatever? Well, I don't there's all kinds of cool stuff that could happen with big data, but it's not my job to pimp that. It's <laughs> my job to worry about it. Um, I would think... I'm actually more interested in interesting things in art and culture and fashion. There's been this trend. Uh, we've seen a variety of designs of clothing and makeup and hairdos to defeat surveillance. Mm -hmm. I wish I had some good Google like keywords to give you or, or Bing or whatever uh, um, to, to find this. But it's like there's this weird like hairdos and makeup and weird clothing that like resists thermal you know detection and stuff that's taking like the idea of anti-surveillance into something fashionable that makes, like, if we all dressed like this, it'd look like Blade Runner or something. Which actually, one last science fiction book I will promote. <laughs> um, and it's a graphic novel called Private Eye by Brian Vaughn in a future where we stored all of our stuff in the cloud and then the cloud burst one day. Mm -hmm. And all the data got out and it ruined everybody's lives, basically. And so now, in that post-cloud burst future, people, one, don't use the internet, Two, they all dress in really outlandish costumes and masks whenever they're in public. 
<laughs> I, I have a, I have a, a twenty. So I, I have a twenty second. It's free. Uh, choose your own price. Google for <laughs> Brian Bond Private Eye. I have a twenty second answer to you. Uh, it, it, th there are huge benefits to big data, and the question is how we collectively want to draw boundaries. And so, small example: um, my building in New York City and every other residential building has a little gray box that measures uh, energy flows. Uh, which uh, so a big data approach to understanding the way the grid is actually functioning. Hugely valuable, uh, uh, money and other things. Uh, but the box is also recording at a very granular level, apartment by apartment, circuit by circuit, what's being tripped and when. And they're storing it and networking it and associating it, uh, you know, apartment 12A with my name. Uh, and, and that has huge surveillance implications uh, and, and nothing to do with the big data mission. <laughs> Can I just quickly answer that? I know that we have to stop, but um, <laughs> I think that there's. I, th I think, yeah, that you imagine being able to know uh, which of, of, of the parents in your neighborhood were idiots enough not to you know, vaccinate their children against measles. Those, the, the neighbor kids walked through your door and suddenly there was, a, there was an alarm clock on and they were like, no, you don't play with him anymore. You know, the, that, that could become very real very easily with labs on chips. Right and and stuff and I think that there is hope. I think I think if I could change any one thing about the NSA right now, it would be that they just hire more women. You know. <laughs> and on that note. <laughs> we could talk forever about this, but we have to keep we the um, schedule going. But thank you all so much. You it was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks.